Praise the Lord. It's good to see everyone. Welcome to South Hill Calvary Chapel. We are going to worship this morning because the Lord is here. And it's, we're going to sing a song that, that says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That's from Psalm 150, as you know, and that's a musical psalm. And it says, let the stringed instruments, the harp and the lyre, the, the high sounding cymbals, everything that has breath praise the Lord. And we are instruments here this morning, too. So we just want to, to worship. We want to praise Jesus. Amen. So let's all stand. Amen.
Good morning, church. It is good to see each of you. Um, I just, I'm thankful for you. Uh, love you. Uh, we love each other as a church, and it's just good to be here together. Um, it's so nice to have a family that uh, the Lord put together. We get to love each other, care for one another, and we just truly love you. And if you are new and visiting, uh, we want to welcome you, put our hands together, welcome you. If we could come out there and give you a big hug, uh, we would, but uh, we can put our hands together for you. So, welcome. Um, if you would, wouldn't mind, we have an information sheet in the bulletin. Uh, just put down your name, an address, uh, email address, and we would love to t- contact you, just talk with you, get to know you a little bit. Uh, so, if you can do that for us, that would be greatly appreciated. And also, if you just have any prayer requests, you can always fill that out there. We have a just a quick, brief announcements this morning. We have a getting back at Acts. We have a big study today, and we get to take communion together, um, take the Lord's Supper together. So that'd be good. Um, throwing me off. Got Brian and Tanya over on this side of the church. It's just confusing me. <laughs> so the first announcement, uh, back by popular demand, is the evangelism class. Um, Pastor Allen put that on. Uh, two. Hey, yeah, there you go. <laughs> We had uh, two classes, we had to expand it, and so now we're actually having a third session of that. And so it's on uh, February 23rd and March 2nd, uh, two Saturdays. So we just encourage you as a church, we want to make it available again so you can come be a part of that. So that's available, um, information table, you can sign up there. The children's ministry retreat is coming up, the first announcement about that. Uh, two nights, um, the, or one night, March 8th and March 9th, Friday, Saturday, and this is for a third through fifth graders, and so uh, we love the kids to come, the gospel, what better thing can you talk about? And this year, my daughter, who's in the third grade, gets to go for the first time, and she's a little bit nervous, but she's excited about it, and she's trying to find a friend to invite, so encourage your kids to be a part of that and to bring a friend. Um, next, we have our Easter choir coming up. We have a meeting for that. We've done one year ago as our first choir at Easter. We did a Christmas choir, and now we're on to the third one, so excited about that. If you um, have been in it, please sign up again. If you haven't been in it, been in it, and we want you to sign up. So there's a sign-up sheet out there. There'll be a meeting, and please come. That's a great thing to be able to do, just to sing together to the Lord and enjoy that. So that's there for you. And one more announcement before we get to have uh, Liz Sorgan before I come up here. Uh, open up your bulletins to the first page on the left there. It says regular happenings. I just want you guys to make you guys aware. Many times we kind of overlook this, but we have a lot of prayer um, going on in the church, and we want to encourage you to be a part of that more. We, you know, the Lord um, is teaching us to be people of prayer, and so we have a lot of prayer services. There's one before, before each of the services. We have um, all church prayer once a month. There's men's prayer. There's women's prayer, and so. We want to encourage you, you know, find a time where you can come and be a part of corporate prayer. And in particular, we have missions prayer, and that's on the second and the fourth uh, Sundays of every month. And they meet up at the church office, two hours up at 9.15 a.m. So please be a part of, of praying. It's uh, just cool to grow that personally and also as a group. So next, I want to invite up Liz Sorgenfry, and she's going to give us a short announcement about the women's ministry. Let's welcome up Liz. Good morning, ladies. Um, Our women's retreat theme this year is Absolute Surrender, and I believe that the Lord has something to say to all of us about uh, fully surrendering our lives to Him. 
It's important that we come together and we learn how to absolutely surrender to the Lord uh, so that we can live out our lives uh, in service to him for his glory. Um, I pray that you would come to the retreat with the intention of hearing from the Lord and that you would allow the Holy Spirit to work in your heart and just yield to him. Uh, the retreat is in two weeks, February 15th through the 17th. Uh, we start Friday night with uh, registration at 5 o'clock and dinner is served at 7. And we conclude the retreat with communion on Sunday morning. Um, we have directions to the retreat out on the table and the cost is $75 until the 10th and um, it goes up uh, $5 and is $80 after the 10th of February. So I hope to see you there. Thanks. Thanks, Liz. So ladies, make sure to get signed up for that. Um, it's going to be a great, great time. Last few things. Remember, uh, cell phones, silence them or turn them off. And if you need to leave the sanctuary during the teaching of God's Word, there's a couple of rows in the back there to seat yourself so we can limit distractions. And now let's pray, seek God uh, for this morning. Father, thank you that we uh, are chosen by you. We're brought into your family. Thank you that you give us the commandment to love one another, to care for one another, to uh, be a family knit together. We pray you would do that to us more and more, Lord, that we would love each other and care for each other. We would sacrifice for one another. Uh, we give of our time and everything for each other, Lord. Please bless, um, bless this church, bless this service now. Be with us as we worship you and study your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Oh Lord, we know that you give and you take away. And what an amazing testimony of that in the life of Job. Lord, we pray for those, Lord, who are on the verge of losing those whom they love. Lord, we, we just want to pray for Militia Sharp's grandmother, Lord, and as she uh, just isn't looking good, uh, we pray that you would especially get Melissa's mother there in enough time to spend with her mother in these final days of her life. We would pray that as well for Melissa. Just give her, Ethan, traveling mercies, Lord God. Just pray, Lord, that you would just, your mercy, your, your healing hand would be upon them. Lord, we know that, that you can heal. We ask that you would, Lord God. We just call upon you as the divine physician, O oh Lord. We also want to pray, Lord, for uh, Thora's mom, Erna, Lord, this friend of Tammy's, Tammy Wilson, and who just uh, looks like they're going to be pulling her off of life support. Uh, we're grateful, Lord, that she knows you. We're grateful for the life you've given her the over 80 years, Lord. And it seems that you're calling her home. I pray that you would comfort the family during this time and ask that, Lord, in Jesus' name. We pray for others that are going through difficulty, Lord God, sickness, those that are dealing with just colds and coughs and any number of things, Lord, that just seem to be rampant. Uh, we want to be sure to lift up uh, Mike Thompson to you, Lord, and ask that you would just bring healing to his back. And thank you and rejoice in the healing you're bringing to Jeff, O oh Lord, his foot. Uh, we also want to uh, pray, Lord, continue to pray for Jenny's mother, <clears throat> Kay, and for her salvation. Uh, we want to thank you, Lord God, uh, for just that Melissa Hadley had a good day today. We thank you, Lord, that Tanya Carpentier's here, and just pray that you would just heal her up, Lord God, for your glory. Lord, we know that she'll give you the glory. We also, Lord, want to pray for uh, Doris's sister, Alice, who's recovering from lymphoma. We pray that the test this week uh, would show that it's been taken care of and that it would not return. Uh, we want to pray for family members that are struggling with various things, children who are being disobedient, and would you give parents patience, encourage them, oh Lord. Uh, pray for those dear sisters who are with child, give them full-term pregnancies, healthy deliveries. We pray for Sue Liljenberg as she's traveling in South America, Lima, Peru, Lord, for a couple weeks. Just give her the word she needs to speak at the conference about healing hearts. Pray that you would be glorified and women would be healed through this trip. And pray that you'd bring her home safely to us on the 9th, O oh Lord. We also want to pray for those who are serving in the military, that you would just be with them, watch over them. We pray, uh, Lord God, for David Holland, who's in France for several weeks. Just uh, I want to lift up Jessica, uh, that you would just be her strength while he's away, just bring him home safely to us, O oh Lord. We pray for this friend of uh, Lindsay, uh, Lindsley Foster, Lord, whose friend is uh, this young girl who's walked away from the Lord. Pray that you would uh, protect her and bring her back to yourself, Lord God. We pray for others who are just wanting to grow deeper in their faith and trust in you. Thank you, Lord God, for just a safe trip to El Paso and for traveling mercies <coughs> for Pastor Jason and Jackie and Iantu as they made it safe and sound to Mexico, Lord. Just thank you for all that you're doing there and the successful construction for the septic system, Lord. We're just, you're an amazing God, and we put all of our trust and all of our faith in you. We pray for Ben and Emily Specter, especially, Lord, as they're asking for prayers that it would be filled with the Spirit and that you would be effective in ministering uh, through them to the people as uh, Ben and Pastor Damir uh, teach, Lord God. Uh, we pray, Lord, and thank you for our 24-7 uh, retreat. Just give them traveling mercies as they head home this afternoon. We thank you for them, Lord. We ask that you would just uh, uh, bless them and just that the seeds that have been planted this weekend would be just settle on the fertile soil of their hearts, O oh Lord. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the children's ministry, for the Abide Junior High and ministry that's taking place there. We love what you're doing with our student ministries and pray that you would really watch over and protect those teams, oh Lord. 
We thank you for the children's ministry, and we thank you, Lord, for this facility. We're so very, very grateful for it. We never want to take it for granted. We realize that there's many churches that, uh, that that's a huge source of uh, a discouragement for them. We know that there are those who've gotten overextended with building projects, and we're just grateful, and we want you to know that. We're thankful for this facility. We regard it uh, as a gift from you, and we thank you for the finances that you provide uh, to have church here, Lord God, as often as we have it. And our prayer would be, Lord, that you would just bless um, and thank you, Lord, and, and praise you for the finances that you provide <clears throat> to, to pay for the facility and so many other things that we're able to do. And our prayer would be, Lord God, that we would always uh, be thankful to you for it. And as we continue in an attitude of worship, that we would, uh, that you would just stir our hearts in the giving of our tithes and offerings as part of our worship service, that we would give uh, generously and that we would give also uh, just humbly, Lord, submitted to you, and that we would recognize that all good and perfect gifts come from you, and that it all belongs to you, Lord God. We, we never want to give by compulsion, but we want to give because of how you've so richly given to us. And so, Lord, as we continue to worship you, would you receive these gifts and would you give the leadership wisdom as to how we can effectively invest them in your kingdom, Lord? And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Oh, praise the one who paid my debt. Let's sing that again. Let's just give the Lord our hearts this morning. He has such good things for us. Let's sing out to the Lord again. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the great news. Amen? What great and glorious news. You may be seated. <clears throat> Man, I love that one. We could just keep doing it a whole bunch more times, then go home and be good. It's so good to be back with you all. Thank you so much for your prayers and your encouragement and uh, just for praying for us. We had a, had a great time <clears throat> with uh, Pastor Jason, who also fills in as my son, and uh, he's been my son longer than he's been a pastor. And uh, it was just a great, great trip. It was a great drive. Uh, we had a lot of just good discussion about life and things. And then I got to spend some time with my mother, who's ce she'll celebrate her 85th birthday. And I got to spend some time with her. I hadn't seen her for a couple of years, which was not a good thing. I should be a better son than that, especially because she's tells me she rates my messages so high on her little chart that she does. And uh, so we had a great, great time. We went through every photo album in her house. And that's hundreds of photos. And I was, I was amazed at how I had not changed one bit <laughs> since high school. I couldn't believe it. First service, I made the comment. We all waved to her and everything. And then I quickly forgot that I got caught up and I mentioned that she was starting to slip a little bit and then realized she was watching. So I said, not really, Mom, you're really not slipping. And, but she's not watching the service because it's not live stream unless for some reason she maybe is. And, but since I'm her favorite, I, I think I'm in good shape. I'm totally kidding. But thank you so much for your, uh, your prayers, your encouragement. Uh, I had the privilege this last weekend, Friday and Saturday, yesterday and day before, of doing worship at the 24-7 retreat, the high school retreat, and it was such a blessing. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but you go into a situation where uh, you're going to be ministering to people, and you end up just getting totally ministered to. I mean, it was so cool. I got to lead worship with Cody, who's just, uh, just such a great young man who uh, he's so patient with me as I'm getting a little bit more involved in, in, in worship. And uh, so it was a great time being able to lead worship. And as I was sitting there watching the caliber of the teaching and the leaders who uh, who were there ministering to high schoolers, I thought to myself, and maybe some of you can relate to this, if only I would have had somebody like Charles and Jason Murdoch and a youth group like that in my life when I was growing up, it would have spared me a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. They're, they're amazing. It's amazing at how much uh, Charles just loves those, those young people. We've got a great group of young people, and I want us to just as a church pray for our student ministries, for what God is doing there, and that the Lord, you know, you start getting into that junior high, high school, you start resisting, and you think you know more than the rest of the world knows, and, and we want to just encourage them to get involved in that. I was so, so impressed with that. 
One of the highlights was the zip line. How many of you remember the zip line that they talked about? And uh, I made the bold statement that I was going to go down the zip line, and not only that, but I was going to do it upside down. Do you remember that I said that? How many of you remember that? Yeah, it was. Uh, so I got to thinking about the zip line, and, I, and there was some talk about Pastor Ron has to go first, Pastor Ron has to go first. And I just had this sudden thought, what if the, I, I'd rather somebody else go down first so I can make sure it's going to hold, because what if it snaps? And I plunged to my death. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I tend to think that way. It's, I got problems that way. But anyway, I tend, I tend to think that way. And I thought, well, what if? Then I saw it wasn't too bad. And, and he gives us all the rules. Here's the helmet. Here's the little harness you put on. And then you hook yourself up. And you can either jump off of the chair and go down the zip line, or you can step off the platform. And of course, I knew I was going to have to jump off of the chair because everybody was looking at me. And there was this this pressure, and they were saying, you know, Pastor Ron, you got to go first, you got to go first. So I just said, okay, Lord, I'm just trusting you in this. And I decided, okay, if I'm going to go, I'm going to go completely for it. I'm going to put my hands out, and I'm not even going to hold hands, and I'm just going to jump off. And the guy said, he said, one rule, don't go upside down. So I said, great, I don't have to go upside down now. <laughs> but I said, I, I can't hold on to the thing. And I said, is it okay if you go without hands? And he said, yes, it's okay. And I said, all right, will I go upside down? And he said, no, you'll be fine. So I said, great. He said, go. And they're all going, go, Pastor Ron, go. So I jump, and I immediately flip upside down. And I'm hanging upside down, and I'm sliding down the zip. My peripheral vision's not working very well. And I'm not kidding you. I see this tree coming by, and I'm certain I'm going to smack my head right onto the tree. Everybody's yelling, yeah, yeah, as I'm just going through, Lord, spare me. And I made it. That is the zip line story. And I'm sure, yes. Amen. And I'm sure that they're all thinking, oh, he's so brave. And they don't realize I was just going, God, please let me get through this. Okay. But it is good to be back. And uh, we, we have a great, great group of high schoolers. So let's open our Bibles and continue. I've been so looking forward to getting back and, and studying with you all. I've been so enjoying going through the book of Acts. Let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 21, verse 27. Chapter 21, verse 27. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand. One of the ushers will be sure to get one to you. You're going to definitely want it because we're going to cover uh, the rest of uh, chapter 21 and all of chapter 22 uh, this morning. Two weeks ago, uh, we uh, finished up chapter, uh, or well, we, we uh, I think we spent two studies in chapter 21, and we left off in chapter 21 two weeks ago with Paul arriving in Jerusalem, even after several warnings that tribulation and difficulty awaited him. And we've learned from the book of Acts and from Paul's letters themselves that he was no stranger to, tri to tribulation. He clearly understood that it was part of being a Christian. He was more than willing to embrace such tribulation because he clearly understood not only that it was part of being a Christian, but he understood that it was important for him to be on the receiving side of such things because, if you remember, he had been on the other side. He had been on the side of causing great distress among Christians as a zealous Pharisee determined to destroy the church by having Christians arrested and sending them off to prison. And as I was thinking about that in the context of our own lives and what you see in his life, I couldn't help but think about this, that when Jesus rescues us from our foolishness, when he rescues us from the insanity of sin, we have infused in us, if you will, a, a determination to do everything in our power to do just the opposite of that which we once were. Amen? That's what happens. And so Paul's in Jerusalem, and he shares in great detail with James, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, and the others, all of those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when the people heard it, they glorified the Lord. They talked about the number of Jews who had come to faith in Christ, 
But there's one problem, and that is these Jews who had come to faith in Christ, they had a little bit of an unhealthy attachment to the law. And through his ministry, uh, they were excited about what was happening. But James, again, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, he pointed out that there was these rabble-rousers that were coming along and they were stirring people up. They were suggesting that Paul was encouraging people to forsake Moses, insisting that people not walk according to the law, which we learned was not the case at all. Paul was very respectful of Jewish traditions in a very good and healthy sense. And to show that the accusations were not true, at James' suggestion, if you remember, Paul takes this Nazarite vow along with four other men. And the next day, when we left off, he takes the men to the temple to announce the, the expiration of the days of purification. And he proceeds to make offerings for each of them in accordance uh, with the Nazarite law, which brings us to verse 27. Let's pray. Father, we thank you <clears throat> for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness, and we look forward to what the Holy Spirit has for us from the Word today. Lord, we ask that you would make it applicable to us. We pray that you would just speak so clearly to us that we would leave different than when we came. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would be active in stirring our hearts to be Christians in the truest and fullest sense of the Word, that you would guard us from any distraction uh, individually or corporately, that we might hear clearly from the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, you'll notice I didn't have you stand uh, this, this morning because we have such a large chunk of Scripture that we're going to actually be looking at in some pretty large chunks that I didn't want to uh, take the extra time with communion and all this morning to read through it and then to go back and read it again. So we're going to start, and I can assure you, you're going to be able to follow along very, very carefully as to what happens. And it begins here in verse 27 of chapter 21. Now, when the days were almost ended, those days that he would have been talking about were the days, uh, the seven days of purification. When those seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Now, anyone was able to go into the outer court of the temple, but there was an inner court of the temple where there was a sign which read, quote, any Gentile entering in will be put to death, end quote. So anyone could be in the outer court of the temple, but there was a place moving towards the temple into the inner court of the temple where no, uh, there, there weren't any non-Jews who were allowed to go in. No Gentile was allowed to go in. And they said in verse 29 that the reason for their concerns in their accusations, is that they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed, and I want you to underline that word supposed, that Paul had brought in to the temple. And here's the first application to us. We can be terribly misled in making assumptions. Has any, have any of you have ever had that problem where you make assumptions and it gets yourself in trouble? We can be terribly misled in making assumptions, in supposing things, which is what these men had done. And we need to guard our hearts from doing this. The, the enemy loves it when we make assumptions. And he especially loves it when we follow those assumptions and begin to regard them as truth. It starts this whole chain of things that are not good. And this is what's happening. It says in verse 30 that all the city was disturbed. Not just a couple people, but all the city was getting stirred up. All the city was disturbed. And the people ran together. They seized Paul. They dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. So we see that, that the whole city of Jerusalem was disturbed. We see a city in uproar. And I find this interesting because the temple in the midst of the city of Jerusalem, it was no small thing. 
Uh, it was a significant landmark in, in Jerusalem. You could see it from wherever you were. You could see and hear all the activity that was taking place with the daily sacrifices. You could smell the meat that was cooking. You could hear uh, any number of things that were taking, uh, taking place. And so there it was in the midst of the city. And for the most part, the Romans left the Jews alone. There were these two factions that lived in a relative peace, putting up with one another. And the Romans seemed to be fine with the Jews uh, just performing their religious rituals, using, knowing that they could use force if anyone got out of, the, out of line. So what's happening? Why is it that the city was disturbed? Why is it that things seem to be running fine? Paul comes into Jerusalem, and now not just a few people, but all of the city is disturbed. What was the problem? And the answer is very simple, and we see that it's the same problem we have today, and it is Jesus. That's the problem. The problem is Jesus, because whenever you throw Jesus into the mix, there's going to be a problem, right? Now, I'm not talking about a Jesus who is uh, who everybody wants him to be, a prophet just like Muhammad or Joseph Smith or any of the other prophets, uh, or a person who's a teacher with some very cool, yeah, he said some cool sayings just like Confucius and Buddha and that sort of thing. I'm not talking about that kind of Jesus. I'm talking about the Jesus that when you present Jesus as the one who came to die for the sin of the world, the only one by which a person can be saved, the one who died for the sin of the world because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And start preaching the message of Jesus, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You're going to tick some people off. You are going to ruffle some feathers. So much so that you're going to have some real problems. And this is what's happening here. Everywhere that Paul went, he was, he was adamant in preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Jesus came to save people from the mess they make of their lives. That's what He did for me. He saved me from the mess I was making of my life, from doing our own thing. And the minute that you take people like that and you suggest to them that they need God in their lives, that they need a God who can forgive their sins, look out. You're going to start having problems. Some of you may have seen uh, somebody who, who posted, <clears throat> I can't remember uh, who it was that did, but on Facebook they posted this receipt from a, from a waiter or a waitress. Uh, apparently the waiter or the waitress told the customer to have a blessed day. Imagine something as horrible and hateful as actually saying to somebody, have a blessed day. And their response was this, quote, they, they wrote it, on a, a, the receipt that they would pay for the meal. They wrote it on the receipt, and here's what they wrote. I'm tired of people like you shoving religion down my throat by telling me to have a blessed day, three exclamation points, end quote. Can you imagine such a horrible thing as that, as telling somebody, some of you, how many of you tell people to have a blessed day? You stop it. That's a hate crime. <laughs> That's not right. Then they really drove home their point by putting uh, a big underlined zero for their tip. Well, we see a lot of cities today disturbed, don't we? Cities in uproar. These days angered by the narrow-mindedness of Christianity. But as we see in the life of Paul, we mustn't let that deter us. Paul is an incredible example of what our response is should be. Now, look at verse 31. I don't think any of us have run into this problem. It says, now, as they were seeking to kill him. As they were seeking to kill him because of what he had said, because of preaching Jesus. Imagine this if you can. I'm, I'm pretty sure that there are none of us here, because of preaching the gospel, someone has sought to kill us. I'm sure that uh, for the most part there isn't any of us that have experienced that. But this is what they were doing. They were seeking to kill, uh, to kill Paul. Now I remember when I was in uh, the army, I'd gotten, I was getting drafted, and it was at a time when the, uh, it was in the early 70s when 
The Vietnam War was winding down and I was in basic training with those who had get, were given the choice of jail or the army. That's not the kind of guys you want to just be hanging a lot, around a lot with. Jail or the army, there were other guys. Just a, uh, It was not a good time to be in the army and there's this one particular guy, he just, I don't know how to explain it other than he just wasn't right in the head. I mean he just, he had some issues and he'd cause, everybody knew it, and you didn't ever want him as your shooting partner on the range. You, you know, live ammo and the whole deal. You just didn't want that. And so I remember standing in formation, and we had to count off to like four or something. And how, you, you remember this when you were in gym, and you didn't want to be the partner with somebody, and you, so you'd quickly do the, the math, and you'd say, hey, trade places with so-and-so, and you'd try to do a real quick change up so you didn't have that person. Well, I tried that, that stunt. And uh, he ended up getting in trouble by the drill sergeant. What are you doing, soldier? And he got in trouble. And he looked at me, and it, he ended up not being my, my shooting partner that day. But as he was walking over with his rifle, as he was walking over, he just looks at me with these beady eyes, and he says, I'm going to kill you. And I didn't shoot that well that day because I just remember looking over to the left and looking to the right. Where was that guy? I didn't want him to put a beat on me and take me out. These men were seeking to kill Paul. And as they were, news comes to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. In that day, right on the corner of the temple, right outside the temple wall, there was Antonio Fortress which was a, a military barracks that was built by Herod the Great, right next to the temple. And there were these castle-like towers and these guards. They would keep an eye on things in the temple, making sure that things like this didn't happen. And if they did, that they could take things under control. And that's what happened. And so verse 32 says, He immediately took soldiers and centurions. He ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Oh, how noble of them. Uh, they were well on their way to killing Paul, beating him to death. And these guys are such chickens, they're such cowards that as soon as the soldiers show up, they stop beating him. 24-7 retreat, Pastor Charles is sharing about when his older brother would pick on him. Uh, just like uh, older brothers and sisters do. And he said, he would pick on me, he would, he would just... He would just uh, uh, bug me to the point where I'd just get so mad. And then when mom and dad showed up, uh, he'd stop like he wasn't doing anything and point the finger at the innocent victim. And we've all experienced that. And that's kind of the picture that I get here. The soldiers show up and it's like, what, what, what are we doing after they've just been done pounding Paul? Well, then the commander comes, verse 33. He came near and he took Paul and he commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried uh, one thing and some another. Uh, the multitude did not even know what was going on. This isn't the first time we've seen this. Do you remember back in Acts chapter uh, 19? Do you remember the riot at Ephesus where over 20,000 people rushed into the theater? They're angry over the fact of Paul's preaching Jesus and it's, it's hurting all the silversmith's business of making these little shrines to the goddess Diana. And it says that these 20,000 rushed into the theater. And Acts 19.32 says, Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them did not even know why they had come together. And we see the same thing here. Some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. So when the commander could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. In those kinds of situations, when one person's saying one thing and the other person another, or persons, uh, or persons are saying something else, what do you do? You remove the parties involved. When my, my kids, my two oldest sons, man, they would just, Pastor Jason and his older brother Joey, they would just fight, they would go out. They had to pull them apart, put one in one room, the other. They'd interrogate them and try to figure out what on earth was going on. And so... When Paul reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying out, Away with him! Verse 37, Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, May I speak to you? And he replied, the commander replied, Can you speak Greek? Now, I've always gotten a kick out of this particular bit of scripture. Because I can just imagine that this commander, this very proud Roman commander 
that he's thinking that this is some doofus who doesn't know anything and they're about to find out quite the opposite. The commander is possibly thinking something to the effect of, uh, this guy's a joke, just another one of those stupid Jews. Because remember, they didn't like one another. And suddenly, Paul bursts out with a little bit of Greek, to which he responds in verse 38. Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? But Paul said, and he gives him his credentials, he says, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. And so when the commander had given Paul uh, permission to address the crowd, and I love this about him, Paul stands on the stairs, he motioned with his hand to the people, and when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language saying, now, he busts out here in Hebrew, a Greek one minute, Hebrew the next, and I want specifically to zero in on what Paul says, and I want you to notice this, Paul doesn't defend himself. What is it that Paul does? And here's a good lesson to us. When we find ourselves being ridiculed or mocked or make fun of because of taking our stand for Jesus, and it, how easy is it when, when you're getting in trouble for something that's not justified, you just want to defend yourself? Well, how does Paul defend himself? He defends himself by giving his testimony. He defends himself by giving his testimony. And I want to call attention for a few minutes to the fact there are few things, if any, more powerful than a person's testimony. Every Christian has a testimony. And I'm not talking about a person whom you can't really tell if anything has happened in their lives or not. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a genuine conversion that is dramatic because every conversion of a soul is dramatic. Amen? Every conversion of a soul is dramatic. I think sometimes we tend to be enamored with those testimonies where people are on drugs, where they're living in streets, they killed a couple of people, uh, or a number of things. And those are powerful testimonies. But sometimes we can easily slip into thinking that my testimony isn't very powerful because I don't have that kind of of testimony and it simply isn't true and Paul would be a bit of an example of this Paul was a religious man Paul in many respects uh, in that day was a moral man he was a Pharisee he was righteous in every way according to the law and it was accepted by many in that day many Jews many of the religious <coughs> that he was doing a good thing by trying to destroy the church and yet the power of a testimony is, is in the transformation of a heart. That's where the power lies. And oftentimes, people don't know what's truly going on in a person's heart. Uh, they, uh, they put, that person puts on a great show. Now, I was one of those. I was one of those in individuals. In fact, if you were to ask my mom, tell, tell us about what Ron was like as a child. Oh, he was a very good, he was a very good boy. He was very loving. Oh, he was this. He was that. Uh, but that's because I was very good at letting my, my mother and my father and others around me see what I was like on the outside. But only I, and even more so God the Father, understood what was going on in the inside. Understood what my heart was really like. He knows the wickedness of a man's heart. He knows every selfish and, and perverted and self-centered thought that is there. And as I think about the power of a personal testimony, I can't help but wonder if the reason more people aren't impressed with Christianity is that they really don't see the evidence of a transformed life. They hear a lot of talk about Christianity, but they don't see the power of a transformed life. That's what was so powerful about Paul's life. It was transformed. It was evident. And I think sometimes we can jump in uh, to just telling everybody Christian things and not really zeroing in on the fact that I was once dead in my sin. I was lost. I was without hope until I met 
Jesus Christ. I want you to hold your place with me right there and turn to Ezekiel chapter 36. Head over to the left. You're going to pass a bunch of uh, prophets, and then you're going to see Daniel, and then the very next book to the left of Daniel is Ezekiel. Go to Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 24. In the book of Ezekiel, the Lord is telling his people, the Jews, that he's going to cleanse them of the wickedness in their hearts, which they've given over uh, to idols. Now, we've just read, if you've read your Bible reading in a year, how many of you are reading through the Bible in the year and you're hanging in there? Oh, God bless you. Hang in there. Unite. This is... Our year, this is going to be our finest hour. Hang in there. Some of you may, I couldn't raise my hand because I'm six days behind. Get caught up. You can do it. You can do it. Uh, this morning, if you, some of you have read this morning, we just read in, um, in Exodus about uh, this very thing. They'd given over to idols. It's so easy to give yourself over to idols. What, what did we read just this morning? Uh, we read how Moses has taken too long up on Mount Sinai, and there's wonder, they're wondering what's taken him so long. And uh, so pretty soon Moses hears a bunch of, you know, routes, just a lot of activity going on, and he's thinking they must be singing, and the Lord says, you better go down there. Because they were taking so long that the Israelites said, well, what's taken Moses so long? And, and he said, well, I don't know. And he said, well, we want to worship something. And he said, well, okay, give me all your jewelry. I'll throw it in this fire. And it says very clearly that he... He took time, Aaron, I'll never quite understand this, he takes time to carve out and to make this little golden calf, and they're all worshiping it, and they're all having this good old time. And then he gets down there, and Moses says, what's going on here? Aaron said, you know what, here's all I can tell you. I gave everybody, asked for their jewelry, I threw it in this flower, and boop, here came this calf. And of course, we know that that's not the case. We're so prone to be given over to idol worship, and it takes all kinds of forms. And the Lord knew that. And he wanted to cleanse them of the wickedness of their hearts, which they had given over to idols. And look what it says in verse 24 of Ezekiel 36. It says, For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness, from all your idols, and I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. You know, why is it that new hearts keep God's judgment, judgments and do them? They do it for one reason, because they've been transformed. Because they've been made new. The old man is gone. The new man has come. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Behold, all things have become new. It's when the heart's made new. How many of us tried to make our heart new before we came to to Christ? It It was an exercise in futility, wasn't it? We just couldn't pull it off. But Jesus, he just comes in and he miraculously makes this old, nasty heart new. And I see a lot of people today within the body of Christ who will say, oh yeah, I I gave my life to Jesus. I became a Christian when I was six. I think it was VBS or something like that. Or I grew up in a Christian home. I've always been a Christian. Oh yeah, I prayed that prayer once. Or I raised my hand or I went forward or any number of things. And listen, I believe the scripture tells us that those things mean nothing without the evidence of a transformed heart. Amen? Without the evidence of a transformed heart. And on the outside, as was the case with me, a person's heart can seem just great until you find out what's really going on there. And God knows. And so Paul gives his testimony. He tells him about his life before he met Jesus and what was going on in his old nasty heart and how he was given a new heart on the road to Damascus. Look at verse 1. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. And then Paul said, I'm indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia and brought up in, the city at, in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you all are today. 
I persecuted this way to death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the council of the elders from whom I re also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains, even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Paul says that that, that is who he once was, what he was all about, and he thought he was doing it for good, all in the name of God. But then he says, verse 6, now it happened. Remember when that day we could say, then it happened. Then it happened. As I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, which was his Hebrew name, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see, remember he was blinded for three days, since I could not see for the glory of that light being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. And then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and he stood and he said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour I looked up at him. And then Ananias said, now I want you to pay close attention to the next three verses, verse 14 through 16, because we're going to see several things here that are not in chapter 9 of the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, chapter 9, all we read is that Ananias comes to him, he lays hands on him that he might receive his sight, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. But we don't hear anything else that Ananias had told him not a lot of detail, whereas Paul, in this personal testimony, he tells us more. We see that Paul uh, gives more detail as to what Ananias said. Look at verse 14. Then Ananias said, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. Now, I want you to pay close attention to those three things. Three things we see. Three reasons the Lord had chosen Paul. Number one, to know God's will. Number two, to see Jesus. Number three, to hear the voice of his mouth. These are great things to consider in our own lives. These are three things why Jesus saved us. Number one, that we might know God's will for our lives. He has a will and a plan and a purpose for each of our lives. And that's why he saved us. Number two, that we might one day see Jesus. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait for the day we see Jesus face to face. Although we have the opportunity to see him quite frequently in the word and in how he works in our lives, the day will come when we will see him face to face. And finally, number three, he saved us that we might hear the voice of his mouth, which is the word of God. How we must seek to love his word, seek to hear the voice of his mouth. Uh, we must be ever so careful that we just don't get so focused on reading through the Bible in a year that we don't understand what the Lord is speaking to us because the Word of God, the Bible, is the voice of his mouth. Ananias then tells Paul that he was called to be a witness to all men of what he had experienced. Verse 15, for you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. In the same way that Paul was to be a witness to all men of what he had seen and heard, we are to be witnesses to others. We're to take opportunity uh, to tell every opportunity to tell others about what Jesus has done for us. And I personally think that we can rush too quickly into telling people they need Jesus. You just need Jesus in your life. And we don't get, I mean, what do you do with that? I remember one time I forced, I shared this story before, I went, to, I determined, I just got to tell everybody they need Jesus. I got to tell everybody. So I stopped at Krispy Kreme Donuts. I said, can I get a dozen donuts for the youth group or something? I can't remember what I was getting them for. And I just said, I got to tell him he needs Jesus. Or I, I told him, no, I said, you know, Jesus loves you. And he looked at me like, here's your donuts. See you later, bud. I mean, what does that even mean? Now, yes, it's true. 
But I think sometimes we can go so quickly to just telling them things about Jesus without ever telling them what Jesus did for us. Amen? He saved us. He rescued us from condemnation. A genuine heart-shared personal testimony can be an essential part of a person inquiring more about Jesus. Be prayerful about that. Make sure that you're just not throwing out a bunch of head knowledge and that you're sharing what Jesus has done for your life, how he's impacted your life, because they will understand an impassioned telling of what Jesus did for you. Uh, people, you can tell when people are passionate about something, can't you? Uh, some of you may remember Chuck. Remember Chuck um, Vincent? Remember him? He was, a, uh, <laughs> he was a carpet cleaner. He had a carpet cleaning business. That guy was as passionate about cleaning your carpet as anybody. You, you wanted to pay him double for cleaning your carpet because he was so impassioned. And it'll get down there. In the, he was from Texas. It'll get down there in the fibers and it'll pull up that dirt. He was so, it was like, sign me up. I want to get my carpet clean. And I don't even have carpet. I mean, it was just an amazing thing. And sometimes, yeah, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian. But man, when you look at somebody and you say, you know what? I, I got to be real honest with you. I was so dead in my sin. My heart was so heavy from the things, the darkness I was involved in. I met Jesus. And man, he rescued me. He made my burden light. He brought peace to my soul. Man, you, you share from your heart with people, they're going to be compelled. They're going to either get ticked off at you, they're going to blow you off, or they're going to say, I want to hear some more about this Jesus and Paul continues with what Ananias said, verse 16, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. I love this underline, this in the Bible. Why are you waiting? Why are you waiting? Listen, a lot of times we just keep waiting. There's no need to think about what we should do. There's no need to think about, well, what ministry do I need to be involved in? I wonder what my schedule looks like this week. No, Ananias tells him to get after it and we know from Acts chapter 9 that's precisely what Paul did because it says in Acts 9 20 that immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues what did he preach that Jesus is the son of God and everyone heard and they were amazed and they said is this not the one who tried to destroy those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring bring them bound to the chief priest but it says Saul increased all the more in strength and he confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. And I get convicted by that. I, I think it's easy to sit around and learn about Christianity without, without being part of the Christian life. I think we can be guilty of just a bunch of head knowledge without really beginning to understand what it means to be a Christian, what it means to live as a Christian, what it means to talk to other as a Christian, as a representative of Jesus Christ. I think may the Lord help us to not default to just Christianese. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Just those things that it's almost like blah, 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 blah. We regurgitate Christianese instead of just talk about the lover of our souls, the one who went to the cross for us. Oh God, bring us people that just ask us what Jesus means to us. So we can just say, you know what? You have a few minutes. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is looking to direct those kinds of divine meetings. Do you believe it? You believe it? He is. He is. We're to fall in love with Jesus. Now it happened, verse 17, when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance. And I saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing me. And then he said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. He's telling them what Jesus had told him. Now we know that Paul would enter into a city. He'd go straight to the Jewish synagogue. He'd preach Jesus there until which time they would, re, 
eject what he was seeing, and then he'd move on and begin ministering to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews. And look at verse 22. And they listened to him until this word. Until what word? Until the G word. Until Gentiles. Non-Jews. And then they raised their voices and they said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. The unregenerated heart is so wicked and self-centered that in that state, we cannot bear the thought that God may love someone else other than us. And may I suggest to you that even as Christians, we've been guilty of that very same thing. We hate to admit it, but it's true. Just take some time to read Matthew 20, uh, verse 1 through 16, the parable of the workers in the vineyard. We just read it this past week. And we read that those who worked a full day were angry that those who worked a partial day at those who worked a partial day because they received the same amount of pay. And haven't each of us at different times been uh, guilty of that, sinned in this way at one time or another as Christians, thinking to ourselves, I can't believe God would save them. I can't believe God would save them. Or at the very least, I'm more deserving of salvation or I'm deserving more of a blessing than they are. I can't believe God. They've only been a Christian for three weeks. I've been a, I, Lord, I've been serving you for 30 years. How come they got that? We can all be guilty of that. And what stems from is that we have this idea, this thinking that somehow we deserve something that somebody else doesn't, doesn't deserve and we become the judge, and when in fact God is the one who determines what people receive and don't receive. Now remember this because the tension between the Jews and the Gentiles we see throughout the Bible and especially in the New Testament stems from this whole thing. People in the flesh naturally wanting the things of God only for themselves and their understanding of what a holy life or a Christian life should look like. That's the dynamic here. and We'll conclude then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust in the air. I always think to myself when I read that, what a mature way to handle not getting what you want. <laughs> the commander ordered Paul to be brought into the barracks and they said, and, and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they uh, shouted so against him. And as they bound him with thongs, with these leather straps, Paul decides, I, I don't think we're going to do this. <laughs> Now, I don't know if he's thinking, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do this beating thing today. I'm just, but we know that he was in the Lord's will. And Paul said to the centurion who stood by him, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? And when the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander saying, take care of what you do for this man is a Roman. And then the commander came and he said to him, tell me, are you a Roman? He said, yes. Commander answered and said, well, with a large sum, I obtained uh, this citizen, citizenship. He was able to purchase it. And Paul said, but I was born a citizen. And then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. And the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. Would be to God that from what we read and gleaned from the scriptures and let settle upon our hearts, that our genuine love for Jesus would cause an uproar in our cities. Amen? An uproar in our cities. I believe as we grow stronger in a desire to be worshipers of God, lovers of Jesus, that this will begin to happen. Uproar in our cities, in our workplace, in our families, in our neighborhoods. Why? Because it cannot be denied how passionately we love the Lord and are committed to serving Him. Great reminders of this kind of passion we see in the life of Paul. And may it be so in each of our lives this morning. Amen. May it be so. And how does it happen? How does it happen? 
And how do we lose it? We, we lose it because we get distracted again, not to beat a dead horse, but I think we got to get it to settle in our hearts. We get distracted by doing the church thing, by doing the Christian thing. I think that's one of the sweetest things about being at the 24-7 retreat, just leading worship and just seeing these, these uh, 16 and 15 and 17-year-olds that are just worshiping the Lord, knowing what they're going to go to. They're going to go back into literally the living hells that a lot of those schools are for these kids. Just crying out to God, wanting, loving Him, appreciating Him. And sometimes we can forget what Jesus did for us. And that's why I think it's so important, uh, appropriate that this morning we close with communion, reminding ourselves of what Jesus did. That was the purpose of the Lord's table. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're remembering the, the, the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May the Lord give us a passion to wake up, oh Lord, will you bring me 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 100 people who want to know how much I love Jesus. But listen, it won't come until what? Until we love Jesus. It won't come until we think more of Jesus than we think of ourselves or of our circumstances. And when we begin to be lovers of Jesus uh, in that way, People will take note. They'll start asking us questions. And we'll have an opportunity to do what is more enjoyable than anything else you can imagine. Just telling people what Jesus did for us. Lord, so we ask that right now in your name. We ask that you would draw us to a place of being so secure, so certain in the things of you and in our relationship with Jesus, that we're eager, chomping at the bit, waiting, can't even wait to be able to tell somebody about you, about what you did for us. Lord, would you just renew our hearts this morning in our own personal testimony? And will you just continue, Lord, to just solidify deep within the rest recesses of our souls, how glorious it is that we were lost, now we've been found, our hearts have been made new, that our hearts of flesh have been, uh, our hearts of stone have been replaced with a heart of flesh that feels love, that knows love, and that is able to worship you. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. Prepare our hearts now for communion. Prepare our hearts, Lord. You, Paul told us in his letter to the Corinthians that we're to search our hearts. We're to see if there's anything in us that, anything in us that would hinder relationship with you. You know what those things would be. There may be things that we're trying to hide. Maybe we've been trying to pretend we're something that we're not. We have an opportunity this very day to acknowledge that, to lay it before you and to confess that because we can't hide anything from you. And so, church, can we just be honest with the Lord here? And as the emblems are being distributed and we're worshiping the song, Sing these words to the Lord. Let him minister to your heart. Or just listen to the words. Or just pray. I believe that his forgiveness is as close as our confession of the need for forgiveness. Let's take some time as the emblems are being distributed and then just hold on to them. And we'll partake together as a church body. Think upon your sacrifice to be king of me, poured out to death many times. I wondered at your gift of life. I live that place once
Once again, Lord, we are gathered together as a church family. And, oh, Lord, I just echo the words of Pastor Phil. What a blessing it is to be a part of this church body. What a blessing it is to be in one another's lives. Once again, by partaking of communion, we look upon the cross where you died. That's what you said. You told the disciples that this is your, this bread represents your body, which has been broken for us, and that as often as we eat this bread, we're to do it in remembrance of you. We're to look upon the cross where you died and to be reminded of it. You took the cup and you said, this is the cup, my blood, the new and everlasting covenant. As often as you drink of it, you said, do it in remembrance of me. Once again, we look upon this cup and we see the cross where you died. We're humbled by your mercy. And focusing on the cross causes us to be broken inside. And when we want to find condemnation for our sin, we find that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we're able to respond once again, I thank you. Once again, I pour out my life. Brothers and sisters, we will not pour out our lives until we're broken and filled with an attitude of thankfulness. Let's just think, thank you for the cross. 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 Once again we look for it. And once again I look the from the cross where you died. Humbled by your mercy, I'm broken inside. Once again I thank you. Once again I pour out my life. As we partake of the bread this afternoon, let's once again remember his naked body that was nailed to the tree for the forgiveness of our sin. Let's partake. The Bible is so very clear that without the shedding of blood, there is no removal of sin. And that life is in the blood. And we know that eternal life is in his blood. He said, this is the, the cup, my blood, the new and everlasting covenant. As often as you drink of it, do it in, remember, in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you for saving us. We thank you for dying for us. We thank you and once again desire fresh and anew to pour out our lives for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's partake. Let's stand together and we'll close <clears throat> with one, one last chorus. I want to just encourage you, there's always people up here to pray with you. 
anything that's on your heart. I'm going to be in the foyer after service. I'd love to be able to pray with you, talk with you, encourage you. I appreciate Pastor Phil so much. I appreciate him humbling himself and just saying to everybody how much he loves you. That's not an easy thing to say. Not because he doesn't love you, but just because he's being a little vulnerable. You know, that's not the most macho thing to say. I'd come down there and give you a big hug. Some of you people who may be new, you're thinking, oh, dear Lord, what kind of church is this that they do that kind of stuff? That's the way we feel about one another, amen? We have to put up with one another at times. It's difficult at times. When it's all said and done, we love one another and we need one another. And we love one another, why? Because God first loved us. So if there's any way we can serve you, any way we can encourage you, you just let us know and always feel free to come up for prayer. Let's just sing together. A thousand times I
that you, by the cross, have given us access to the throne room. And we cry out to you today, Lord. I thank you for your church. My brothers and sisters here, Lord, that you are a God who never leaves us or forsakes us. And you are trustworthy and you are faithful. 